Until now, no one has looked at public transit in Baltimore through an equity and environmental health lens. When we did so with the scientific and technical assistance of the Johns Hopkins University Bloomberg School of Public Health, we saw lots of inequity along racial and ethnic lines and lots of opportunity to better serve all the people in this city. I'm Samuel Jordan, president of the Baltimore Transit Equity Coalition, BTEC. We mapped four key metrics for Baltimore City transit equity, social vulnerability, pollution, and health. In all the maps, a darker color indicates areas of greater need. When we mapped transit equity, we saw the patterns marking major differences between white and black residential areas. We also see opportunities to improve average commute time and the difference in commute time between those taking public transit and those using a personal vehicle. When we looked at social vulnerability, we again see racial differences emerge. The darker areas show neighborhoods whose residents are more likely to live in poverty or to be people of color. Looking at air pollution, we saw that areas close to the Patapsco River in the southeast had a higher burden of air pollution, possibly related to Baltimore's port industry emissions and the incinerator. When we looked at health outcomes related to air pollution, we saw again patterns indicating racial inequity. But downtown and areas along the water lit up as places for opportunities as well. To encourage investments in public transit, we overlaid all four maps to identify areas most in need of attention, equity, and investment. Let's work together to build a better Baltimore and connect those most in need of jobs, healthy food, education, and health care with exactly what they need through strategic investments in public transit. Andrea McDaniels, Communications Director with the Bloomberg American Health Initiative. We're going to talk today about transit equity, looking specifically at the city of Baltimore. Our panelists today include Samuel Jordan, co-founder of the Baltimore Transit Equity Coalition, Megan Latshaw, Bloomberg American Health Professor with a focus on environmental health and engineering, and Keisha Pollock-Porter, Professor of Health Policy and Management and Vice Dean for Faculty at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Part of our discussion will um, focus specifically on a report that Samuel Jordan and Megan Latshot um, did on the city of Baltimore. So Mr. Jordan, welcome. Uh, you've been working in, on this issue for many years. Can you talk about how transit and equity impacts people? Absolutely. Uh, what we discuss, and I'm Samuel Jordan, president of the Baltimore Transit Equity Coalition, BTEC. And our focus has been for six years since within two hours of Governor Hogan's cancellation of the Red Line Light Rail project, a fight against the racial basis of public transportation policy. But it isn't limited to simple uh, formulations or services and programs in public transportation. In Baltimore, as a matter of fact, we can say that the public transportation system is dismal at best mm -hmm. and is dysfunctional. What we're speaking of as well is the impact of pollutants generated by the public transit, uh, by the transportation sector, which as you know, generates at least 40% of the harmful uh, emissions in the nation, but the impacts are also racially distributed. And that's where our uh, project has its most uh, value, I believe. What we have done is to identify uh, through the uh, work of uh, an amazing team assembled by Dr. Latchow at uh, Hopkins uh, Bloomberg School of Public Health, but to identify the communities most in need of uh, mitigation, reduction in the uh, harmful impacts and interventions. And having done so, what we are seeing now is that there are at least six clusters of communities in Baltimore that are desperately in need of investments. And that investments, these investments will address the uh, interconnection of transportation, uh, public health, and the environment. Now, our studies have shown a, a, a variety of impacts, but particularly with respect to, to health and the environment. Uh, in our study, we uh, assessed and found uh, impacts with respect to um, cardiovascular disease, for example, asthma, um, COPD, even low birth weight in newborns, 
but these were all disproportionately distributed and racially disproportionately distributed. They follow the same pattern. What has been called, uh, as you may have heard from Dr. Lawrence Brown's work, uh, the black butterfly and the white L. Well, that's been confirmed by the data. We weren't looking to confirm it, but the data shows that same picture, that we're dealing with a legacy of racism in public policy, but particularly in public transportation policy. So give an example, and, and quickly, that is, um, particulate emissions. We normally consider when we're speaking to people about uh, emissions from uh, transportation sector, they're thinking of gases. Well, PM 2.5 is actually perhaps the most deadly in that uh, breathing these nanoparticles, some of them are at least 1,000th the uh, diameter of a human hair, over a lifetime. You can imagine why, since these are breathing, breathing lung shredders, why members of our communities, people of color communities, would be more vulnerable to the ravages of the COVID-19. So Ms. Lashaw, can you talk a little bit about what you hope the report that you broke down with Mr. Jordan, what do you hope that accomplishes? What do we get at in bringing these issues to the forefront? Because as he said, you know, people in the community, they already know about this. Mr. Jordan already knows about this. Why get this on paper in a report? Sure. So, you know, what we've seen historically is communities know what their problems are and, you know, they often bring them to policymakers and say, you know, we have this problem and you should do something about it. Um, but a lot of times until they actually have data in hand, it's not taken um, seriously. Data is really hard to refute, right? And so we, um, Samuel said to me, he said, let's make some maps because maps, you know, a picture is worth a thousand words, right? And so, he said, let's map transit you know, access and efficiency, and let's map social vulnerability, and let's map air pollution related to transit, and let's map health effects related to that, and then overlay all these maps. And so our goal in doing that was to create a, a visual representation and also to create an evidence based for driving policy change, right? We know that there's going to be a lot of funding hopefully coming um, for infrastructure in this country. And there's funding coming to Baltimore for infrastructure. And so if we can help to drive that funding to the areas that will benefit the most, um, we think that's really important. And just to add on sort of what Mr. Jordan said, you know, investments in transit not only lead to reduced air pollution and greenhouse gases, um, but they also can improve access to education, right? And access to jobs and access to health care and access to healthy food. And, you know, a lot of the times also if you use transit, you're out there walking or biking to get to and from your transit stops. And so there's so many health benefits linked with transit um, that I, I, I hope that our report will be able to, to, to drive some policy change. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Latshaw. Um, and Ms. Pollock Porter, uh, you work on policy, um, policy around these issues. What types of policies do you see both locally and federally that could you know, help with these transit and equity issues that we see in Baltimore and other places. Yeah, I'm so glad we're having this conversation and I applaud the work that Dr. Lakshaw did and Mr. Jordan around this report because it provides some data and gives us a sense of where we might wanna go with strategies and policies. So what we're seeing around the country um, is in terms of some local policy solutions, it's thinking about these access issues that, that were lifted up uh, in terms of um, employer subsidies to help with cost, um, ensuring that systems are um, reliable, uh, that people actually can get to them. Um, Dr. Lashaw mentioned walking and biking to, to stop. So we think about walking, biking, and rolling to and from transit, ensuring that streets are designed where people can do that safely. Um, there was mention of the infrastructure bill at the federal level. Well, we know that the bill requires states to address cycling and walking safety. Um, and there will be resources coming down. So ensuring that those resources are deployed to the communities that have been historically um, underinvested and in, historically marginalized will be critical because we need to see investments and resources allocated in a way that's equitable. And our policy strategies can help to support that. Um, and Ms. Latshaw, what's next for the report? What are, the, what are next steps for you all? 
Great question. So, you know, as, as Dr. Pollock Porter mentioned, um, there's a lot of uh, potential opportunities around this. So not just transit, but getting to transit and the last mile. And so, um, you know, Mr. Jordan is working on, uh, you know, translating our work to policy and he's working with legislators and, you know, trying to get meetings with the mayor. But in the meantime, we um, have some funding from the Bloomberg American Health Initiative to reach out to those neighborhoods that we identified as being high opportunity neighborhoods. And we wanna go talk with them and you know, say, you know, we know you know this is an issue, but what do you wanna do about it? And how can we help you? Um, because we really believe that this should be a community driven work and we want, um, to help you know them in any way to accomplish what they think is a, a priority. We also are in the process of expanding the analysis to the Baltimore region. Um, so we're looking at all the counties surrounding the city and ultimately may even do an analysis for the state. Um, I'll stop there. You know, Mr. Jordan might want to talk about um, the opportunity. Uh, you know, I think there's there was a bill last year that was introduced to to make such analysis um, required. So perhaps that's a good segue. So we have about a minute and a half left. So uh, maybe you can quickly fill us in on well, this. Let me, let me try because uh, as Dr. Latchell mentioned, as I have said earlier, the, the identification is just a start. We want to move from identification to a sustainable intervention. And that requires uh, several things. One, the community uh, education. So we engage in communities that have been identified. We're also seeking to engage uh, policymakers and legislators in supporting a process that moves from identification to assessment to design of an intervention and then implementing a sustainable intervention that can meet these problems over the long term. And uh, this is where I think we're going to need a different, uh, we, we have advances in technology. For example, we're using a, uh, we want to use, in Frank, uh, uh, hyperlocal analysis even more granular than what we have to date to give a more uh, accurate picture and also a more uh, dramatic picture, frankly, of the ravages of this pollution. And uh, I think with that kind of support, uh, again, working with uh, Dr. Latshaw and the team at uh, Bloomberg, that we can achieve a case that is supportable, fundable over the years, and can even be codified at the state level. Well, thank you. You guys are doing great work. Um, and I hope that enough attention is bringing is being brought to this issue now that we actually actually start to see substantive change in these communities, particularly in the Black Butterfly of Baltimore. So thank you all today for joining us and participating in this panel. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank you.